Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the Changemakers LA podcast, presented by Lisk LA. The Changemakers podcast is a tribute to the people and places that work to make Los Angeles neighborhoods good places to live, work, and play. My name is Tanua Thrash Intuk, and I'm the executive director of the Local Initiative Support Corporation Los Angeles office. In today's episode, we'll be talking about the growing income inequality and what the affordable housing field is doing to advance equitable growth in communities. And we've got some special guests with us today. First up, I'd like to introduce Alexis Slank. She's a senior project manager at Bridge Housing. Before joining Bridge, Alexis was a project manager for Thomas Safran and Associates, where she managed the development and refinancing of affordable housing projects in LA County. Prior to that, Alexis was a municipal credit analyst for Standard & Poor's, where she provided financial and legal analysis of affordable housing and other tax-exempt bond issues. And she served as the primary credit analysis analyst for more than 10 state housing finance agencies and public housing authorities. Her work experience includes working for Skid Row Housing Trust, where she managed the development of PSH, Permanent Supportive Housing, for formerly homeless individuals. Alexis, thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. Next up, we have Jarrett Moore, a project manager at the Coalition for Responsible Community Development. He's been in the real estate industry for the past seven years and is also a part of this year's LIST cohort of 2020-2022 Housing Development Training Institute uh, Fellows. A lifelong Southern California resident, Jared also brings his passion for business development, crime reduction, neighborhood beautification, and housing affordability together in a concerted effort to fend off gentrification in traditional African-American neighborhoods. Great to have you here, Jared. Glad to be here. And finally, I'm thrilled to present Justin Davis, COO of Landspire Group. As the Chief Operating Officer, Justin brings over a decade of experience chartering multi-year investment strategies that target systems and structural change. Justin is also the founder of the Wayne Group, an Oakland-based real estate investment group that acquires two, three, and four-unit rental properties with a priority of keeping housing accessible and affordable to teachers, nonprofit leaders, and first responders. Oh, that's great work, Justin. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Glad to be here. And I'd like to thank all of you out there for joining us uh, today in this important conversation. You see, in 2018, almost half of all renters in the United States were considered to be either moderately or severely cost burden, which means housing costs exceeded 30% of the family income. The COVID-19 crisis has highlighted and exacerbated the growing income inequality that has left millions of households behind. Specifically, income inequality between black and white households has worsened. Although the median incomes of both black and white households grew in the last decade, black household incomes rose more slowly. The median income for black households in 2019 was 43,200, roughly 60% of that of the white households and the lowest of all other racial groups. Black renters were twice as likely as white renters to be behind on rental payments and twice as likely to report being at risk of eviction. For today, let's discuss what can be done to make affordable housing more available and creative ways professionals in the field are approaching this subject and this complex issue in a holistic way. Jared, we're gonna start with you. CRCD is doing a myriad of programming in the community. How are you all looking at holistically focusing on housing instability to make sure we create more stable options for people in South Los Angeles? So uh, the, the, the key word in that question to me is holistic. I think there's been a deepening and uh, enriching of the understanding that when we're housing people that have housing instability, it has to be a complete and comprehensive process because you have to work on the person as well as the process. And so the way CRCD has approached this, our entire business model has actually surrounded that particular idea. So what we have at CRCD, we have four departments. We have 
a workforce center that's about employment empowerment. We have a housing de a development department that is about case management and, and, and getting people off the streets. We have a youth department that's about bringing up and empowering young people. And then obviously the real estate department where we actually do the nuts and bolts of, of, of creating buildings. And what we do is we have wraparound services that integrate all of those particular fields into our clientele, into the community. So we focus on the location, which is South Central, and we're very specific about how we oppose South Central's needs. And then we're very specific about the things that people in this area and community are doing to make housing unaffordable for them. So we're trying to really address the actual human needs of the people. And that, that's essentially it. We even have a financial coaching uh, supported by LISC, uh, where we also work on income instability as well. So we don't just look at it like, hey, here's this apartment, move in there, you're good to go. No, we work on career stability, income stability, and mental stability as well. Thanks for that. And Jared, what I heard in there is that you're putting the person first uh, in order to be able to have an impact on the community. And you repeated it several times. I mean, this holistic approach is really critical. Not only are we looking at making sure that people are stably housed, but we've got to make sure that they have the financial resources, the work, the career, the ability to be able to sustain that. And people can't see you, but you know, you pointed to the mind. So making sure that the, the heart and head are healthy and are able to, to thrive as well. So Justin, I want to get you in on this conversation. What does equitable growth in communities look like for you? I mean, you all are private developers. Um, how is Landspire Group working to make this happen, creating equitable growth in communities? Thank you. That's a great question. And it starts with our, our mantra, which is development without displacement. We believe that we can create new housing opportunities without displacing or changing the fabric of the of the culture with any particular community and with that is sort of just recognizing that with any sort of development or project or change that's happening with the community there's going to be a influx and outflux of capital uh our priority is making sure when any project that we do that we are building something that's not going to allow for the outflux of capital. We don't want capital to leave the community. We want it to stay there. So it's being very intentional about what you're developing and making sure that the people who are coming into that community want to come there with the understanding of where they're coming into and appreciation of what currently exists and then wanting to contribute their capital to the growth of that community. And with that, we believe that we can create more equitable housing outcomes and more equitable opportunities for those people that currently exist in the community. That's fantastic. So this idea that not only are you bringing in capital and resources and changing the physical landscape, but to the extent that to bring that in, we want to make sure that that circulates in community. So the jobs, the contracts for small businesses, all of that to the extent that it can, the goal is to keep that in community so that that equitable growth opportunity can take place. It isn't an extraction of resources, it's something that you're bringing in. That's super exciting. Alexis, the work that you're doing over at Bridge is all about preserving historic communities. How did you all go about doing that with your Vermont Manchester property? And for our listeners out there, maybe tell us a little bit about the Vermont Manchester property and how its development is so historic in the, the South LA community. Sure. So Bridge Housing has been around 30 plus years with the goal of providing quality, affordable housing. We are involved with the Vermont Manchester Project um, with CRCD and Primestar Development, which is a local commercial developer, and it's redeveloping a part of a site that's been mostly vacant since the 1990s civil unrest, Bride and King riots, that time period. The county and Mark Lee Thomas, as a former board supervisor, got together, they gathered the land, and they were separating it into two separate projects. There is a public boarding school that will be run by the Seed Foundation, which will provide a, a school setting for residents in the community. And then we're building 180 units of affordable housing. There's about 60,000 square feet of retail, including a neighborhood serving gr grocery area, a 15,000 square foot metro training center, 
and, and a transit plaza. Vermont is the second busiest line for the metro system. And we'll be building a transit plaza and like redeveloping a site that's been underutilized and kind of a blight in the community in the meantime. Will the county put together an RFP, like what had to be on the site, but really working with the community and having multiple community meetings, figure out what do people want? So it's not just us coming into the community and saying like, this is how it needs to be, but like, what type of stores are you looking for? Like looking at the, it has, it has to be affordable housing based on the design of and how the site was taken over. But, you know, how do we make sure that the needs of a program meet the needs of the community as well? So we're really working on that. That's critical. Jared, it looks like you wanted to get in there because Alexis, this whole question was about how do you preserve communities and a critical piece of that includes having the community be part of determining what goes on the site. Jared, you agree with that? Oh, completely. There's always going to be this push and pull. This, and I think Justin spoke to it earlier about influx and outflux, where it, there's this strange relationship between beautifying the community, bringing amenities into the community, and then now all of a sudden values are going up. And then those residents that help beautify, that help build that community are now iced up. And I think the Vermont Manchester project is really at the crux of that. This is like a living social experiment. And part of the social experiment is integrating the community's input, finding out ways that their needs, their demands are met, while also understanding the myriad of complications and complexity and actually building something that tremendous. And so, we, for example, what we did was we created a community action uh, committee uh, called VMCAC, where we bring in members of the community, some of them are more vocal than others, some of them older, some of them younger, some of them have their own companies or real estate properties, and everybody has these competing interests. And so it's really a fantastic blend and a, and a challenge for us to sort of make sure that we can beautify, we can build up the community, but also preserve affordability. Thanks so much for sharing that, Jared and Alexis, for talking about the project, uh, putting the community at the center, engaging them, giving them an opportunity to self-determine what goes there. And Justin, you pointed to this as well, which is how do we make sure that as we bring those resources, those resources stay there and they circulate. So Justin, you know, our other colleagues on the line are with nonprofits. They are nonprofit affordable housing developers and holistic community developers. But, you know, your organization is a for-profit development company. And what do you think might be needed to try and attract more for-profit developers to help create more affordable housing and to make sure that it stays affordable? There's such a huge need for it. It's great we've got nonprofits. People know that I'm definitely behind that. But there is a space as well for for-profit developers. That's right. And, and I think you have to be mindful of all the different players that are involved. Right. You have folks like myself, a for-profit developer. We have, you know, the CRCDs of the world. We have the list of the world. I think we all have different objectives, but we have to find where those objectives align. And I think for many of us on this call, it's understanding that there's an issue, right? And we're trying to address the issue. Most for-profit developers, I don't think they look through that lens of seeing that there's a problem. They want to just address the problem. That's where Landsire, our vantage point is first. We recognize the problem, but then we also recognize that, or we're very acutely aware of the opportunity, right? From being able to leverage the tax breaks, leverage the different partnerships, and know that there's a return to be made at the end of this. And I think more for-profit developers, unlike Landspire, they kind of want to know is, first question, what's my return? The lenses are completely different. But I think when you're able to convince someone that, hey, there is a great opportunity in terms of return, but there's an even better opportunity to change the community. There's a better opportunity when you're able to change the lives and change generation of folks. So it's really on that individual to understand hey, what, what are you in it for? Are you in it to change lives? You're in it to transform communities? Or are you simply in it for a return? And I think when you kind of identify that, and hopefully it's more on the understanding of what can we do long-term in terms of transformational 
change, I, I think that's where you're, you're going to see more for, for-profit developers getting into the space. And some simply are just going to want to get into it because of the opportunity to make money. Well, Justin, you know, I almost want to say you've you've got the heart of a uh, nonprofit affordable housing developer, and we're glad that you're in the space as a result of that. Very few for-profit developers get on a call with me and start talking about how can we change generational wealth opportunities? How can we change the outcome for people's lives and community? And so that's great to hear. And I think it's a big part of your success, but I know that it begins with folks like you as one of the founders and leaders of Landspire and your other partners who have proximity in terms of background and experience with these communities and understand that there are lots of returns that we're getting. Not only is it financial, but it's also just a a betterment of community and our world going forward. Alexis, you and Jared have had a chance to work on really advancing economic opportunity there at the Vermont Manchester program, at the Vermont Manchester development. Might you share any best practices or things that you learned along the way? I see Jared smiling there. I might give you a chance to quickly get in on this. What's it like working in community, trying to bring people together, give them a chance to self-determine? What can we share with friends out there who are like, I want to do that, but how do I do it right? Right. Well, I think the key things with with bridge housing and partnering with other people who know the community and no one needs to think they're going somewhere to save someone. Like people were there to begin with. It's like, how can you use like the the skills that you have to help a community continue to thrive what they want? So one of the big things that bridge does is looking at like a lot of of data collection. So it's, it's figuring out like, what do people want before you decide like, this is what needs to happen there. It's like, no. So it's part of our Jordan Downs redevelopment. You know, we have a very large community development group surveying the community to figure out what exactly do they need. Like not everyone needs new backpacks. Maybe they need better access to like pins and paper or, you know, Wi-Fi, like understanding like what are the actual key things that people need and, and asking them first versus coming in with your preconceived notions about what needs to happen there. I think specifically at the Vermont Manchester site, it's like you're going to have a vocal community of people who want to be involved. That vocal community doesn't represent everyone. So really taking the time to go out into the community to get other people's opinions and having other ways for people to contact you because not everyone feels comfortable joining a conference call or maybe they can't join a call depending on what time it is. Or we had community events when those were still available in, you know, in the public and pre-COVID. Um, but you know, having lots of different types of access points to get people's opinion about what happens in their community. I think it's been a really key thing for us. Yeah. So you start with the just disabuse yourself of the notion that you're there to save. You're you're there to continue to facilitate what was already there. You uh, create all kinds of access points. I like that uh, for opportunity. Jared, anything we want to share with people in terms of best practices? I have rather things that are share from best practices from this project. But interestingly enough, and I don't think my boss knew this when he assigned me to the project, but I grew up on Manchester in the city of Inglewood with my mother. And then I also grew up with my father on, on, the, on Vermont in, in the city of Gardena. So I passed by that corner, I don't know, three, four times a week for 10 years, 15 years. So I have a very intimate relationship with the community, the understanding of it. And I've, I feel very blessed to have gone through my, my financial training I am a certified economic development finance professional by the National Development Council. And so (laughs) I understand the work of a credit analyst. And so what I've always done is, I think what Alexis's point was about listening, absorbing that input and applying it as best possible. What I've done as a member of the community and as a credit analyst is to say, okay, you guys, I know you guys went the sun, the moon, and the stars <laughs> on the corner of Vermont and Manchester, but this is how it really works. Okay. You know, so a company, they, for example, they want a Trader Joe's there, right? So it's not that Trader Joe's doesn't belong there. It's just that the for profit finance people within the company at Trader Joe's, they're looking at numbers. Okay. They have lenders, they have partners that they have to 
request and prove their uh, intentions to also. So it's also about teaching the community as well as listening because they're really intelligent people. These are people that graduated from Berkeley and Stanford and are just very passionate about wanting to see growth while sustaining the culture. And so I think the best practices that people can learn is don't be afraid to take the time to educate people about the hard work of you know finding people that are actually going to show up to the jobs that we make available the hard work of making sure that the small businesses that we want to be present have their accounting together they have their tax returns you know simple things supplier diversity so it's also about informing and educating the community in addition to listening well jared i i understand your personal con connection to Vermont Manchester. I grew up uh, just near there on 98th and Figueroa, so spent a lot of time going by that intersection and hoping one day that it would be developed into something that we could be proud of. So glad to see you all working on that. For today, folks, we were really focused on talking about how to bring equitable growth and opportunity to community. We were joined today by three professionals, one in the private sector focused on making sure that affordable housing not only provides a valuable return, but is also something that provides a valuable return to community and to individuals and to circulate and make sure that resources stay in community. And we had the pleasure of being able to hear from two other colleagues, both Alexis and Jarrett, who talked about their project at Vermont Manchester and how that project is a testament to being able to do equitable development opportunities. I wanna thank Justin, Jared, and Alexis for joining me in this conversation. Your insights I imagine will be invaluable to the community development space as we continue to try and figure out how do we respond to the income and wealth inequality in Los Angeles. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. This episode of Changemakers LA was made possible by our partner, City Group Inc. LISC LA is committed to working with community groups and developers dedicated to preservation and development of affordable housing and sustaining housing projects in the region. We provide a variety of flexible housing lending products designed to help local groups bring development projects to fruition with loans and funds covering every phase of development from pre-development to permanent financing. If you'd like to learn more, please visit us online at www.lisc.org backslash Los Angeles and follow us on Twitter at LISC, L-I-S-C underscore L-A. You can find the rest of the series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Subscribe to hear more conversations about the people and places that shape Los Angeles.